Hello. Uh, welcome to our session. This session is titled Sustainability in the Curriculum, Getting Students to Think Creatively About Sustainability. And we are welcoming five members of the FIT faculty to join in a discussion about the things that they have done in their courses to integrate sustainability as a theme. And so uh, we'll give each, each of us will share a little bit about what we've done, hopefully to inspire others to, to, to integrate sustainability into their courses as well. Um, so we'll be having kind of an informal discussion, sharing some slides, asking each other questions and learning. So here with us today are myself, Dan Benkendorf, uh, Kelly Burton, Ann Cantrell, Lisa D'Onofrio, and Evelyn Reinkiewicz. And um, we'll start by just introducing ourselves. My name is Daniel Benkendorf, and I'm an associate professor of psychology in the social sciences department here at FIT. And my research interests are um, kind of eclectic, but one of the things that I've been interested recently in, in looking at is the impact of consumer behavior and consumer culture on, uh, on well-being, on individuals' well-being, and also looking at how experiences in nature can be restorative, um, how they can have a positive impact on our well-being, and how they can also influence our um, pro-environmental behavior. So um, I've written a, a few different courses, but one of the courses that I've written here at, at FIT is called Psychology for Sustainability, which I'll talk a little bit about when it's my turn. Kelly, Great. you're up. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Kelly Burton. I um, work in the continuing ed department. I teach um, ethical fashion one and two and social responsibility in the apparel industry. Um, and I'm just writing a new course for sustainability reporting. I work mostly in industry. Um, I'm the chief sustainability officer for material exchange, which is a tier two sourcing um, platform. And I sit as an industry advisory board member on the textile development and marketing department. So I'm happy to share my insights as well. Hi all, I'm um, Professor Ann Cantrell, an Associate Professor in Fashion Business Management here. And um, I am uh, the course coordinator for the Sustainability in, fashion, in Sustainable Fashion course, FM 326, which I'll talk about. And um, I also have my MBA with a concentration in sustainability and I am a small business owner in Brooklyn, New York as well. Hello everyone, I'm Lisa D'Onofrio. I'm a professor with the Fashion of department, specifically the fashion design apparel area. I am a sweater and knitwear designer and have had the practice and focus to um, implement zero waste, sustainable knitwear. And I teach and wrote a course called FD 358 Knitwear Design and Construction and have some other modules in work um, following the same suit for the fashion department. All right, hi everybody. Um, my name is Evie Rinkowitz. I'm a professor in the science and math departments. Um, I'm an ecologist. Um, my research focus is in disease ecology, um, and I'll tell you about the disease ecology class that I've written that I've been teaching for the last couple years. Um, but I also just teach ecology and biology classes. So, um, most of those are in the sustainability and ethics minor. Um, so I get a lot of students that are interested in learning more about the science behind how we think about sustainability. Um, and yeah, a lot of what I do is sort of getting students to think creatively and um, getting them to engage in like, you know, a personal way with what I teach because a lot of the students are sort of maybe new to science or maybe they haven't sort of thought about how it relates to what they do. And so that's one of my goals is to get them to sort of think how about how that works within their majors because they're all design or business majors and taking a science class. So I'll talk a little bit about that when it's my turn. I just wanted to do a quick intro about sustainability on campus. There, um, I think we're all seeing the really students are so um, engaged in this topic, whether I'm teaching freshmen and it's an intro to fashion class or I'm teaching seniors and it's my um, sustainability class. We just are seeing the engagement on all levels of campus. 
Um, I hope everybody is familiar with the minor in sustainability and ethics. It's the fastest growing minor and the only um, one that is interdisciplinary. The, um, and uh, we're really um, seeing um, strong growth in this area. I also wanted to make sure that everybody knows that FIT is a member organization of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. I have a slide coming up in a moment. And there's so many other ways to get involved on campus. President's Council on Sustainability um, works on the Sustainable Awareness Week. We also have a conference in the spring as well and other ways to get involved. But yes, I wanted to make sure that everybody is familiar with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which concentrates on circularity. They have an amazing resources for, um, for educators. Please sign up on their mailing list. They have an event on October 20th with London and New York City educators. They're also trying to get um, form a working group uh, where we would meet in person eventually. Um, and they have some really great programming around COP26 coming up starting at the end of October and other ways to get involved. Next slide, please. And uh, before we get started in hearing all the amazing ways that um, these professors are utilizing sustainability in the curriculum, I just wanted to um, open everybody's eyes to different ways to think about sustainability. Of course, there's um, uh, recycling and eco-preferred materials, but when we look at the sustainable development goals from the United Nations, this is a great video that I play in class. Um, it has a lot of, for lack of a better word, celebrity endorsements looking at this, but from poverty, hunger, good health, quality education, reduced inequalities, all different ways that um, we're really seeing how um, sustainable development can really be utilized and implemented in um, business today. Next slide. All right, so I think it's my turn. Um, so I just wanted to start by talking a little bit about a couple of approaches that you can take if you're interested in sustainability and you don't currently teach a class that is on that theme, um, or you even if you don't feel like you have anything in any of your classes that touch on either the UN Sustainable Development Goals or anything relating to sustainability, but you think you could, there's a little room to add those things. So um, the first, I, I, I call it two approaches because there really are there probably are many more than two approaches, but um, the way that I've thought about it in my own curricular development and the way that I, I teach my classes is um, kind of a, a gentle approach or a more modest approach and then a like a, a sledgehammer approach. <laughs> and so the, the first approach is to think about the courses that you're teaching um, or um, you know the, the courses that are already on the books, right? That, that um, maybe are required for your major um, or that students are already taking? And how might you integrate sustainability into them? And so as, as Ann just talked about, there are the, the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. And that, that's a really helpful framework to think about sustainability as a really broad concept. There are, you know, I think a lot of the ways that we end up operationalizing sustainability um, tends to be talking about environmental issues, talking about, um, you know, climate change, but sustainability, as we just saw, is really much broader than that. Um, it touches on so many things that have to do with business, that have to do with society and politics, um, with production. So it almost doesn't really matter what content you're teaching. There is always um, a, a sustainable lens that you can deploy. So um, take, for example, in my own field of psychology, it's not the first area most people contemplate when they think about environmental issues. They think about about Evie's classes, probably, um, about biology or ecology for good reason. But if you think about um, things like uh, environmental problems as not just being environmental problems, but being social problems, being problems of really of human behavior, then it becomes really easy to see how things like, you know, you could talk about pollution, neurotoxins, overconsumption, greenhouse gas emissions, all being caused by human activity. And so as a psychologist who studies um, the science of human behavior, it's, it's deeply relevant. And I think um, that's just in my case as a psychologist, but I think that there are many ways um, to, to think about our disciplines, uh, whether it's thinking about the history of the discipline or thinking about, about production, thinking about how human beings are involved in, in our areas, that we can see those UN Sustainable Development Goals present. 
Um, and so it, it, it often just re requires stepping back a little bit and looking at your discipline in that way. Uh, one simple way to begin to dip your toes into the green waters of sustainability is to just look at the examples and illustrations and stories that you tell in your classes. So if you're a math instructor, for example, um, or economics or statistics, um, the examples that you use, may maybe you can change them. Maybe you could introduce examples um, that have to do with sustainability or pro-environmental behavior. Um, you're using graphs maybe to teach a particular mathematical concept. Could it be about um, recycling? Could it be about upcycling? Could it be about how people feel about the environment? Could it be about um, you know, meat consumption? Um, any number of things that connect. Um, also, there are a lot of ways that you can create assignments uh, that that can embed sustainability into your classes. So, for for example, most of us, a lot of us, talk about um, you know research in some capacity, right? So, how how you know people in our discipline or experts in our discipline might do research. And so, in my case, as a social scientist. Uh, I talk about surveys. Surveys are one of the most commonly used methods by social scientists, including psychologists, to, to do their research. And so um, I used to talk about, I used to actually have my students contru construct a survey to uh, ask their peers and ask other people on campus about food preferences. And then about five or six years ago, I said, okay, this is an easy way for me to change the subject um, to a more productive question, maybe. And I, I asked them to start designing surveys about how people feel about the environment or how people feel about materialism. And so I can still teach the same concept, how to design a good survey, how to analyze the results of the survey, but the, the topic is different. The example is different. This is, you know, none of this of course is limited to a psychology class, you know, a graphic design course could develop visuals for a sustainability campaign, a toy design assignment could look at recycled plastic and eco-friendly paints and dyes. I mean, the, the list goes on and on in, in terms of ways that you could do this. There are also a lot of resources that are available to FIT faculty. So you can tap into those resources. This event um, that you're watching now is part of Sustainability Awareness Week. That happens every year. And there are always um, speakers and workshops, um, sometimes tours that you can avail yourself to and your students to and embed those into your courses. Um, in the spring, we have the annual Sustainability Business and Design Conference, where there's more of the more of the similar type of programming with a, a bit more of a thematic focus. But again, ways that you can really integrate without doing a lot other than just checking the program, integrating those things into your into your course um, in ways that are relevant. There's also the Sustainability Grants Program, and we have workshops um, that are offered to so you can learn more about that. But that offers funding for projects that may require additional resources, financial resources, um, and so you can apply for those competitive grants. Also, of course, there are guest speakers, so maybe you don't feel like an expert. Um, you don't feel like an expert on climate science. You don't feel like an expert on hunger and poverty or production or any of it, but you can bring in someone into your class um, that, that can speak to it. And some of those experts may be your colleagues, but they could also be from outside of the institution. One, one example um, that I use in my, one of the classes I teach, I talk about behavioral contingencies, which are the things that immediately precede um, or come before and follow a behavior. And psychologists understand that those things are what we need to study if we wanna influence the behavior in question. And so um, one of the examples that I use is composting. How would you start composting more? How could you develop a habit to compost, especially if you live in an urban environment and it's inconvenient or um, you, you don't want your apartment to smell bad? Um, and so I brought in um, a, an expert in composting from Grow NYC to talk to my class, and it was a huge hit. The students really loved it. Um, I didn't need to be an expert in composting to talk about that. So that was great. Also, uh, you know, don't be afraid to let your students direct you. Uh, I know that we're the instructors and we're really in, you know, supposed to um, impart knowledge and we do to our, to our students, but they have such passion and they have so many great ideas and they connect to so many um, you know, interesting networks that can really bring in new resources to your classes. That's something that I've seen in my classes. It's often my students who have 
some really great ideas that I end up implementing. And that that also makes them feel great. It makes them feel, you know, a greater sense of confidence and autonomy that they're having some influence over their coursework. And then last thing here I would say is that the independent study is a really flexible tool that can be used um, if you don't have uh, really a place in your course, maybe you've got you know everything that, that you're covering, you must cover in the way that it, it has to be covered and it really doesn't connect to sustainability, independent study can be a tool that you might use um, to embed sustainability into the way that you teach. Um, to the next slide here. Um, the second approach, so the first approach is the, what I call the, the gentle approach, where you're just, you're looking at what you're teaching and you're just trying to incorporate sustainability in maybe a small way. The bigger approach is creating a course that's focused on sustainability. And I, I think that hopefully you've already started to hear, and you're going to hear more in this presentation about how these issues connect to so many different disciplines uh, all across the board. Everything we teach at FIT has some connection to one of these issues, whether it's one of the UN Sustainable Development Goals or just you know, issues of sustainability, environment, climate change, um, conservation. Um, and just to give you some examples, um, on the right side of the slide you're looking at now, these are just some course titles from areas that may surprise you, right? That don't, it, it's not necessarily an ecology class or something really specific to, to um, sustainability, but it's ways that instructors have have created courses that that sit on that theme of sustainability, but still teach their content area. So for example, um, I, I, you know, in my ignorance was was surprised and, and really excited to see that there was a sustainable packaging design course when I was uh, when I first came to FIT. Um, people often don't think of packaging as sustainable at all. Right. Um, but how important is it to have that embedded into that curriculum? And so that's an example. Um, Ecology in the built environment is an interior design course. Alternative sustainable materials is in the jewelry design de department. And this is, by the way, just a sample. There are many others. Earth Matters, Ancient Environment in Ancient Egypt and in Western Asia is a history of art course. Um, there's economics courses that touch on this with economics of energy and fossil fuels, um, interdisciplinary courses as well, ecology and photography, sustainable New York. So there are just really a ton of ways to do this. Um, and and it's it's often just about being creative and and generating that content. And if you're wanting to do this, but don't have a partner, um, you can look to members of the Sustainability Council or people who have created courses like the ones you see here for help. We're, you know, this is the kind of stuff that, that excites us and we love doing. So we're happy, we're happy to help. Also, um, don't be afraid. These courses are really popular with students. Um, Anne mentioned the ethics and sustainability minor already. It's, it's one of the most popular minors on campus. And um, any course that has content that's appropriate for this minor um, and falls within the minor um, is, is, is guaranteed popularity, I think, because the students are, are hungry for more. So um, don't be afraid to create something. And move to the next slide. Um, I'll just end my piece here by talking about a project that I do in one of my classes. I, I did um, have the opportunity to write a class called Psychology for Sustainability, which is uh, really kind of, we call it conservation psychology or eco-psychology in my discipline. Uh, and it's it's an unusual course. The uh, these, This type of course doesn't exist on most campuses. And it's, you know, credit really to FIT and kind of the freedom that we have here to develop interesting, innovative courses that um, made it possible for it to exist. But that course is really, you know, it's a course where the full theme is on sustainability and environmental problems, re, you know, it, with a new context of, of really not, they're not environmental problems, but they're human behavior problems. And one of the, the kind of capstone project that I do for the students in that course or that they do is called a self change project. And it's a pretty simple idea. Um, the, the, the course talks about all the elements of, of psychological inquiry um, through the lens of sustainability. And one of the things that I think 
um, is important to learn if you're if you're learning about how to how to change behavior is how difficult it is, right? And and to kind of generate some empathy for, you know, why it might be difficult for folks to change habits or to fight against um, a, a societal infrastructure that makes it really hard to practice pro environmental behavior. And so that's really the the um, the reason for the project. And so the students have complete freedom to choose anything that they want to change about their own lifestyle. And I give them a lot of examples. Um, there's a, you know, a, a lengthy set of, of requirements for the project, but one of the first things they do is they monitor their own behavior. So they spend a few weeks just looking at their behavior, looking at um, behavior as it relates to um, carbon footprint and in environmental impact. And many of them, I have some, some images here that highlight some of the things that are most commonly chosen by my students, but um, many of them want to change their diet. So they want to maybe eat less meat or they want to move from being a, a vegetarian to becoming vegan. Um, I've had a number of students um, try the, you know, wear the same outfit for 10 days challenge in various ways um, or limit their use of single use plastic or monitor and then limit their water consumption. One of the most popular things that my students do is try the zero waste challenge where they try to, um, to collect all of their garbage in a mason jar for a period of 10 days. Um, others have looked at palm oil. So you can see the, the dish of palm oil here. Um, and they try to eliminate, try to identify what the sources of palm oil um, and only use sustainable, sustainably sourced palm oil. And it's, it's all of these projects really require them to think about, think carefully about how they define things, define their terms, to monitor their behavior um, carefully, and then, and then to try to, to do these things that are often really challenging. And I encourage them to do things that, that they're really going to be challenged by because they, they learn so much more from that than if they make it really easy on themselves. Um, and so this is, this is just one example of, of a project that I've used um, that gets the students to think about their own role in the world and the, and the positive impact that they can make. Um, and it could be adapted, something like this could be adapted in a lot of ways, I think, for different content. Um, what I'm teaching, of course, is about how hard behavior change is, what kinds of things can help you become successful, um, things like, you know, defaults and heuristics and, and so forth in my psychology courses, but something like this could be easily adapted to another content area um, if, if you're creative. So I think that's about where, where I end and I'll pass it off to our next speaker. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, I think a lot of the things that you touched on, um, I'll be sort of expanding on. So um, I think it's a nice um, flow between what you said and what I'm gonna talk about. Um, so again, I'm uh, in the science and math department. So um, I'm an ecologist. So a lot of what I um, teach has to deal with um, the environment, how people interact with the environment. And so it sort of fits in nicely to thinking about sustainability. Um, and, you know, I start all my classes with, or I start the sustainability section, at least, on my classes with um, defining what sustainability is. And um, this is from my disease class. Um, but sustainable solutions to disease are possible only when all three components of sustainability, social, economic, and environmental, are considered. So, um, like Anne mentioned before, sustainability isn't just thinking about the environment. It's thinking about social issues, economic, political issues, and then the intersection of those, as you can see in this diagram, is really where sustainable solutions sort of lie when we consider all three of those. Um, and the way I sort of like to think about it as well is that it can be really problematic when parts of this big picture are left out. And um, I think we can see that in a lot of different examples when say, we you know, consider the ecology of the issue, but we don't consider how people are impacted by us sort of trying to deal with a certain environmental issue. Um, we see it, so I teach disease ecology. Um, we see it, you know, we've seen it <laughs> with COVID when we think about you know, maybe the biology of the disease, but not about the social or economic issues that you know, are, are um, blocking, say, you know, getting people treatment, things like that. So, a lot of issues um, sort of stem from ignoring one of these. And so 
while you know the focus of my class is the science, um, we really end up talking about the social, economic, political issues quite a bit because that's sort of the the real context to where these um, problems are. Uh, if you want to go to the next one, Dan. So um, I'm just going to give a few examples from some of my classes of some of the projects that my students have done. Um, so uh, I try to do creative projects in most of my classes because that really helps students um, try to engage with the material in a way that is meaningful to them, especially because, again, like none of the students are science majors. So um, it sometimes can be uh, difficult for them to maybe see where they intersect with this topic. But once you sort of let them think creatively, they can do some really awesome stuff. So this was from um, SC-121, the field biology class, and um, I developed, actually I consulted a lot with um, Amy Lemon from English, who's done some projects with communicating um, issues about, about sustainability. So I had a lot of advice from her, but this is basically like a little sort of outreach fair that we did as part of my field biology class. We did it for a couple semesters. Um, this was done during sustainability awareness week, during this week when um, uh, we could have the events in person. And so um, the students worked in groups and they picked different topics um, sort of from some of the topics that we uh, discuss in class to sort of research on their own and think of a way where they could educate other FIT students about that topic. So you can kind of see in the center there, there's um, sort of all those globes. That's um, a group of students who uh, made a little quiz about um, uh, calculating your ecological footprint, sort of how much how many earths would you need to support your lifestyle? Um, next to that on the left, um, some students did a, one about sustainable fashion, how you can sort of restyle the same garment in a bunch of different ways to reduce your clothing waste. Um, the other different ways you can see people have um, uh, tried to engage with um, teaching people about the environment. There's a different, there's a, maybe you can't see it, but they're teaching people how to identify different trees by their leaves. Um, the beaker there on the bottom left is making natural dyes from plants that were foraged in Central Park. So some really cool stuff. Um, all the drawing in the bottom right corner, um, I also have them do some, some drawings for some of their assignments as well that kind of helps them engage a little bit. So this is a way for the students to not only learn more about the topic, it also helps them take that information out of the classroom because I like to sort of turn the students into the teachers because I feel like that's when they really start understanding a topic and it helps them really sort of understand that they can be sort of um, experts in this um, topic as well. If they, you know, didn't think they liked science before or anything like that, they are now sort of the experts that are teaching their peers, which I really enjoy seeing. Um, can you go to the next one, Dan? And then I do a similar type project in my disease ecology class where um, they all research a different disease and then do some kind of creative output about that. Um, and again, thinking about who they might communicate it to, are they trying to communicate about the biology of the disease, social issues, um, how would sort of the, I guess, thinking about the interaction of how people um, respond to the information. You know, I think the designers a lot of time think about how people interact with the objects or the things they actually design. And that's sort of what I tried to challenge them to do, to do with this project is how would people interact with what they design. Um, so you can see here on the top uh, left, a student designed a um, children's wear collection to try to educate people about the importance of vaccines. Um, the top right is um, about shingles, about it can, how it can be sort of like a hidden um, disease um, that comes up later in life. Um, the one below that is um, like a graphic uh, poster campaign about, um, again, about vaccines and how important they are. This is about COVID, I think, in particular. And then the bottom left is actually a screenshot from a little trailer for a pretend horror movie about Lyme disease, which was really great. So um, it really, it, I, I'm always sort of blown away by how creative the students can be when you sort of let them, like Dan said, let them sort of drive. Um, and it also really helps them understand the, the concepts and it helps me think about how I might better teach these topics as well. So as a teacher, I learn a lot from seeing sort of how they approach this as well. Um, maybe next one. And then um, this is just pulling from one example. Um, I talk about HIV and AIDS as one, as a problem that really sort of typifies how important it is to think about the 
sort of biology, ecology, environment section, social issues and environment or political economic issues when is, um, discussing a problem. Um, and uh, what we sort of discuss in my class and what the students end up sort of, you know, coming to the conclusion of on their own without me sort of telling them is that a lot of issues really um, might start out as sort of biology issues, you know, like with HIV, we didn't really know about what the disease was back when the epidemic started. That was one of the big sort of blocks to us treating it. Well, now the issues are really more the social, economic sort of end of things. Um, and so when we try to confront a sustainability issue, we really can't just focus on one part of that Venn diagram. You really have to touch on all of them. Can you click again, Dan? I think there's an animation that comes up. And really, I also sort of wanted to challenge people to have really tough conversations about these issues, which, you know, is is hard. And I did, you know, when I talk about these issues, I try to do as much research as I can so that I can really have sort of as much as I I can to answer their questions. And I talk to experts when I need to, because I really want to make sure that, like, your classroom is a place where you can have really productive conversations about tough problems. Um, but we want we really should be the sort of the way to facilitate students talking about problems impacted by social, economic, political, and environmental issues that we need to address um, because that's how we find sustainable solutions. Um, next one. But then at the same time, um, I really try to um, find examples of success stories as well because I that's something that I think has an ecologist you get used to sort of dealing with these sort of gloom and doom stories you kind of figure out how to deal with them but it can be really difficult for students um, who maybe haven't thought about these things very much and they can come out of like a lesson feeling really bummed out and really sort of like what are we going to do about these giant problems that are affecting us so i really try to find really um uh i guess productive or inspiring positive stories so that they can really know that there are Solutions. This is an example of a, a solution in Nigeria with um, how to treat and identify um, HIV in pregnant women, and it's a really amazing, inspiring story. And so, if you want to click again, Dan. Um, uh, whoops. Um, just really encouraging you to not just think about sort of how terrible everything is. It really celebrates success stories and this to show students that positive change is possible because. I think it sometimes can be really hard um, for students to see through the sort of fog of all of the problems that we have in the world, um, but we can sort of help them see through that and encourage them to really um, be a part of these positive changes. So I think that's my main bit. Thanks. Okay, so I took a different tag to with this, um, and I really kind of, I, I wanted to use it more as a train the trainer, because I think um, as we think about sustainability and we think about where to start, I thought that I would just tell you where I think that we should start, because I think if you don't have sustainability in your curriculum, maybe it's because the, the concept seems too large and, and you're not really sure how to kind of dive in. And I want to kind of take you back in time. I'm of the age when the internet first came to being um, and recognized how, how challenging it was sometimes for people to understand what the impact is or was going to be of digital. And now we don't teach the students the impact of the internet. Internet. It's so ingrained in them. And I think in the next couple of years, we're not going to need to teach them the impact of sustainability because it's going to be so fundamental to their lived experience. But if you're of a different generation, it might be hard to kind of figure out how to start and how to kind of dive in. So this is this is a, a why of sustainability. Next slide, Dan. And it really has to do with this. Um, the climate crisis is something that unites us all. It affects us all. Next slide. Because we are alive by virtue of this very slim um, layer of our atmosphere. And so what, when we talk about the climate crisis, next slide, Dan, what we're talking about is the fact that we are, as, as humans, contributing 
to um, global greenhouse gas emissions that are getting trapped within the atmosphere. So this idea of global warming, which is a term that we don't use anymore, now we've kind of transitioned to the climate crisis, comes from this idea of what we're doing, the age of our industrialization and how, um, oh, I think I just lost my mic, how, um, how this is impacting um, the climate-related weather incidences. You could go to the next slide, Dan. And so really everything that we create, every emissions that we are generating in the world gets trapped in the atmosphere. Next slide. Can you still hear me? Great. Um, and so this is comes from every area that are that the institution teaches. So this has to do with agriculture, this has to do with logistics, this has to do with um, some of the ways that materials are sourced from um, for our fashion departments, the way that animal hides are produced for our accessory departments, extractive industry for our jewelry departments, um, natural resources for our beauty department. Like so, all departments are impacted in some way or form around this this idea of, of fossil fuels. Next slide, Dan. And because I work in fashion, I'll just tell you kind of how it works um, and how it's affected in fashion. So the apparel industry is considered to contribute 10% of global greenhouse gases. So we have a 10% impact of all of this problem area. And then when we break down our supply chain, we can see that actual material production contributes to 52% of that. So there is some real scientific data that will help us kind of help our students narrow in as to what impact based on their subject what impact they can they can contribute to or they can um, consider next slide Dan and I thought I would just give you a quick little lesson if you don't know how we measure impacts or, or who is responsible for which impacts the um, we have divided them into three categories so scope one are really kind of where you are Right, it's from for our retail clients. It's their own and operated. It's the stores that they have. It's their design center. It's really for us. It's the building um, for FIT. Scope two is how um, our energy company sources their energy. So are we on Con Edison? Are we getting you know renewable energy from our energy company to keep the lights on in the building, or is Con Edison giving us coal? Um, fired energy, which is a huge um, contributor to to climate crisis, and then scope three is all of these things that are kind of within our purview, but not really. So this is business travel, this is product footprint, so how the product is designed and moves into the customer's um, purview. This is logistics. This is everything to do with business. You can go to the next slide, Dan. And so when we think about what that means to, again, I'll go back to apparel and footwear industry, what that means, this is Levi's um, GHG footprint. And you can see owned and operated, their scope one is only 1%. So if they're trying to make an impression or trying to reduce their impact, what they can control is only 1% of their scope one but everything else they also have control of. They can choose which products or which materials they want. They can choose which factory they produce their, their garments in. They can choose which way they do their logistics. All of these things are business choices that also affect the impact. Can you go to the next slide? And so it's not just GHG, we're starting to see other impacts that are really making the business case for sustainability. There's water scarcity and security issues. This is affecting cotton production, textile mills. There's the physical and business continuity related to um, climate related weather incidences. So, you know, the impact of hurricanes, tsunami, not tsunami, um, typhoon, flooding, all of these things are affecting our industry. Access and price volatility of raw materials, as the, as the planet warms, it will be harder to grow raw materials such as cotton. We are starting to see a carbon border tax um, being talked about in the EU. So moving materials, raw materials across certain borders is gonna be 
problematic if they're not um, environmentally forward materials. There's access to labor given the migration due to the climate change. There's changes in consumer demand. They know that this is important. They want better products, but they're not sure what that means. Um, and then there's reputational risk. So if you can turn to the next slide. And really the reputational risk is where the business, um, where business becomes the imperative. So this is a picture of Larry Fink, not the most fashionable um, inspiration for, for sustainability. However, he is the CEO of the largest um, investor community. Um, so he's the CEO of BlackRock. And about three years ago, he started to communicate to his investor community that climate change was serious and that he wanted them to do things like have a purpose for the company, like um, set some sort of standards and, and start to measure what the climate risk of is for the company. So what that means is the consumer is seeing consumer facing hang tags that say, you know, this has sustainable cotton, but what they're not seeing is the back end where the raters and rankers, banks and, and analysts are judging the efficacy of brands to meet the coming climate crisis. Next slide, Dan. So this is a rankers and rating report. This is an MSCI ESG rating report on Levi's again. Um, and you can see that Levi's, on the bottom right hand corner, you can see the ratings that, that publicly traded companies get. It ranges from triple C to triple A. Levi's sits somewhere right in the middle with a triple B rating. And then on this left hand side, you can see where the rankers and raters are concerned about how Levi's is poised. First is governance. They don't think that they have the best governance in order to go into a climate crisis future. They're worried about the chemical management and safety. They're worried about raw material sourcing. They're worried about supply chain labor standards. They're kind of medium on labor management. And the only thing that the Raiders and Rankers are impressed about is the product carbon footprint, which I showed you a few slides ago. So this is the internal works of what fashion and footwear and accessory brands are going through. So our students need to, if they're going to get, go and work in business, need to kind of position themselves with some knowledge of what, what these impacts are. And so I think in my final moments and my final com comments, I just wanted to give you, um, my fellow instructors, some, some kind of guidance. So next slide, Dan. Um, the first one is when you're thinking about guiding your students, when you're thinking about how can I bring curriculum into, um, it, or bring sustainability into my curriculum, just think about measurement. Think about what can we take measure of? Um, there's, there's kind of this famous adage about what gets measured gets Manage. And when we talk about sustainability, especially from a business perspective, everything needs to be measured. Um, and then once we know what we're using, so for example, a good example of that would be um, a material footprint analysis. Do you know or do, do your students know when they're making a collection what percentage of their collection is natural fibers? What percentage of their collection is synthetic? Um, what percentage is animal fibers? And then once they know that, they can start to look at what the impact is of those choices, right? This is just very simple, like, okay, let's count and then let's change. Um, and so that's my number two suggestion, is that the data um, helps us make better impact. Next slide. And so I would suggest, as you're thinking about how to help our students navigate this and how to have them help them get um, a foot up in their in their careers and in 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 kind of their education gear towards the sustainable future is to get them to think about better design, better materials, and more durability. Um, and then the last slide, the the tool I wanted to share with you. Oh, sorry, I updated the slides while we were talking. Um, so there's a really great newsletter. Um, that is full of a bunch of sustainability um, advice, reports that come out on regular, and it's goblue.net. It comes out twice a week, and it's really, um, as practitioners, it's really good um, insight as to what's going on in the world of sustainability from a brand perspective, from an NGO perspective, and it's goblue.net. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, and this is perfect to segue in as a professor with the fashion design department. My concentration has 
and it has always been knitwear, sweater design. And my responsibility, I believe, is to implement a mindset that students do focus on better design, responsibility, and the products they use. So the main course I teach runs in the spring. It's um, FD358. It's a knitwear design and development course for specifically for knitwear majors. The, it's a major course required. Any um, 40 of our students go into knitwear design as their concentration, and they'll complete a year and a half with us. But it really does start in the fall term. All of our junior, our entering junior students um, take an intro to knitwear course, and uh, we have implemented sustainability into that course so that it will then branch out into all the concentration areas. And it really does pick up on the idea that students start to focus on where their materials are coming from, what they're using, how they're going to use it responsibly. And it does, it begins in the fall. So all students taking basic courses, they're required to use existing sweaters to create their new sweaters. They're very basic designs, and then they evolve into a term garment. Once the fall course is complete, I will then, I, I teach the knitwear concentration where students have elected to go into knitwear as their specialization. And the, they've already had the introduction to it. So it's still the focus is on upcycling, redesign, creative rethinking, rethinking by meaning the needs of your consumer and what your materials are going to be and where their end programming is going to be. The same thing, reprogramming your consumer, what they want, getting them making vintage, making thrifting, making repurposing, recycling design much more interesting. Um, zero waste tends to be the term. We call it no waste because in the class, what we do is we barter with each other. If someone has something that they're loving that sleeve and they want to use part of their design, they will work with each other. So we end up, even our paper for patterns and things, we try, we use every piece of it so as not to be leaving too much behind. And it's sort of it focuses on closing the loop, making sure that fashion makes a cycle and teaching them that they have to understand where it's coming from, how it's being made, where it's going and where it ends up. It's going to be on someone's body, but where does it go when they're done with it? So students are sort of tasked with coming up with the idea of what am I gonna use? How am I gonna use the whole piece? How am I gonna share it? How am I gonna make my collection interesting and get my my customer excited because obviously it's consumer based but the trend now being that thrifting and repurposing has been in the media and now you know society is noticing that we do have we we waste too much we have too much discardable materials so students are learning they're they're going in my class and they're sort of scavenging through Salvation Armies and, and finding their you know families and their friends and their closets and they're repurposing. They're also, they're using alternative materials. They're knitting with old wire. They're knitting with VHS tapes. They're knitting with things that they can actually find and accomplish. Um, and just showing these pictures, these are examples of some term garments where they're using denim from their closet. They're repurposing, they're making, you know, recreating and, and redesigning. So it really becomes a full circle for them that they understand it. And the good part about that, it has started in the fall term and then now they get the full concentration in the spring. The students that have gotten it in the fall term have brought it into their programs. They brought it into children's wear. They brought it into leather design. They're using existing leathers and recreating new pieces. They're, you, they're doing it in their sportswear collections. And they're all working sort of in a way where there's a more collaborative effort to try to make this something that continues within all their courses. It's become something very focused. And, and the broad part about it, if anybody's out there looking for someone to collaborate with, we in fashion design 
always want to collaborate with other departments. We've done, um, I've done coordinated collaborations with packaging design, where the students in my class are creating a collection, packaging de design is then branding it and making their um, full presentation. And it, then we do it and we do show it at the sustainability conference and we make it sort of resonate so everyone is really working together. And it's a really good way to kind of get it out there. Um, and because my classes are major classes that are required, you know, you could fit sustainability in everywhere and it just sort of helps. And then because they are at the tail end of their junior year, they sort they go into their senior year with wanting to, to look into more sustainable materials, wanting to pay attention to the companies they want to work for, looking for a better seat or those that want to go into their own collection, sort of finding a way to make it happen within a responsible way. So you can go to the next slide. And this is just some of the examples. So they are all, it, it involves creative pattern making, creative construction, assembly, making sure they're utilizing pieces. I have some students that never get take on their own garment. They take scraps from everyone else and they're putting them together. So it's just a matter of making desirable product using what's available to us. And that's it. Thanks so much, Lisa. And it's so great to hear from everybody and how you incorporate sustainability in all your classes. I'm in the fashion business manage management department, so I really loved hearing about um, uh, business as a uh, source for, for good in the world. My um, FM 326 sustainability and fashion management class is now a required class um, on campus, so that is really exciting. But I also um, co-wrote the um, first year experience program, which is a new class for incoming freshmen, and we're in we're um, infusing sustainability in there. In the next part of that, which is FM 109, which will launch in the spring, there'll be a circularity workshop. I teach product development, which is my background in the fashion industry. And there you can really infuse sustainability at every level, at every level talking about the supply chain, raw materials, um, every um, decision that is made. Um, we were just hearing from Lisa about zero waste, thinking about waste as a design flaw. Right? Anything that's on the cutting room floor is going to cost the business money as well as um, be harmful to the environment as well. I teach a trend forecasting class. Here, amongst all these classes too, students, that every example that I feel like they are coming to the table with of companies that they admire and want to learn more about are infused with core values that are really going back to the things that we're speaking about today. My leadership class, um, that is also somewhere where we're really looking at challenging the current system, looking at leaders that are making a difference and um, working towards this mindset change. In um, all of the classes that I'm speaking about, we have really circularity as a main focus. Um, um, in my um, sustainability FM 326 class, we take some time talking about the historical references, starting with the Industrial Revolution, when um, fashion was really changed forever and really dr driven um, production through textile development through the Industrial Revolution 4.0, which is a really exciting time that we're all living through right now. And a lot of advancements and these things that we're talking about are coming from textiles um, and other ways of saving energy and water. A book that we read is Fashionopolis um, by Data Thomas, uh, amazing read and really um, is, uh, has, um, although we've been teaching this class for a while, really um, aligns nicely with the flow of the course. And as um, someone men mentioned earlier too, has a lot of positive examples um, in the second part, second and third part of the book. Some really positive examples of some companies that are working in slow fashion versus fast fashion and um, textile development and such. Our prior book was over Dress by Elizabeth Klein, which I also highly recommend. We spent some time really in um, the leadership class and sustainability class talking about the stakeholder theory. Um, Edward Freeman, um, who's looking at business as a force for good versus the Milton Freeman's model of um, uh, social, um, uh, the giving back to society through the share, shareholder model versus the stakeholder model. And always back to the triple bottom line, people, planet, and profits, and really looking to expand our mind and not just thinking about profitability for some, but prosperity for all, people, planet, and prosperity. 
Um, I incorporate several podcasts, of, um, Business of Fashion, Vogue Business, Future of Fashion, have so many different ways that we can um, engage students in things that are happening right now and so interesting. Case studies as well. We have a Levi's case study, a Stella McCartney case study, but it's everywhere. It really has um, so many ways to infuse this into the curriculum. So we hope you enjoyed our presentation today and got some inspiration for your classes. I know I certainly um, did as well. And please um, look for the rest of the programming for SAW. And um, I hope you will also get involved with the Sustainable Business and Design Conference that will be with us in April. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.